Enemies to Lovers, Coffee Shop AUs, The Omegaverse. These terms are crucially important to the fabric of our society, and they all come from the world of fanfiction. But fanfiction is under attack right now, crushed under the weight of its own popularity. And now it's up to us to find out who is killing it, why, and how to stop them. Today, on Fandom Investigators. <laughs> I would think I'd learned better by now than to go terribly in-depth on moving targets. I should also probably have learned better by now than to make predictions regardless of how much I like to. But what's going on in fanfiction right now is both far too interesting and also far too indicative of the problems of fandom as a whole for me to really ignore. Because I've got a question and you're going to help me answer it. Is fanfiction like over? Is it done? Put sleeping with the fishes? Is the current trajectory of fanfictionary projections simply unsustainable? Or in more intellectual terms? Is fanfiction cooked? For a while, fanfiction has seemed to be the last real bastion of freedom on the internet, as in things that are free. In most cases, there ain't no free lunch. You're paying somehow, even if it's in viewing ads or providing your data, whether you know it or not. And either way, all of these free things are gonna move to a subscription model before very long anyway. Fanfiction is free, and it's free for a very good reason. The law. So let's talk about the legality of fanfiction. Now to be clear, I am not a lawyer yet, so I cannot guarantee that this is a perfectly nuanced and perfectly accurate summary of intellectual property law and fanfiction, um, but quite frankly, not every lawyer can guarantee that either. All I can guarantee you that this is, is research to the best of my abilities. Also, my understanding of fanfiction and intellectual property law is going to be based on the United States specifically for a couple of reasons. Number one being that in my understanding, the United States is one of the stricter countries regarding laws surrounding intellectual property and copyright issues. And then a second reason is that unfortunately fandom studies and studies surrounding fandom topics tend to be very United States and also Europe but mostly United States based online if you're looking mostly at English speaking sources. I would like to be expanding my view on that a little bit. It's one of my goals and it's one of the things that I try to do but it is also true that I make very very little to know money for doing this and uh, have other stuff to do with my time. So just keep that in mind when we're discussing any of the legalities surrounding fandom and fanfiction that those might be different depending on where you are based. So fanfiction is kind of in a bit of a legal gray area. It doesn't seem to be explicitly allowed but it's also not explicitly banned either because the issue hasn't really ever come up so explicitly in court. It's not explicitly explicitly illegal for a couple of reasons. As far as copyright law goes, most people seem to agree that fanfiction probably falls underneath the fair use defense, which you may recognize because that is a YouTuber favorite to invoke. So under copyright law specifically, courts will usually look at four different factors when determining whether or not something constitutes a fair use of copyrighted material. Uh, first, they will look at the purpose of the use. For example, if the use is educational or if it is commercial in any way. Then they will look at the nature of the copyrighted work itself. And then they will look at the amount of the copyrighted work used in comparison to the total size of that copyrighted work. And then they will also look at the effect of this usage on the market or value of the original work. Fanfiction itself hasn't really had its day in court yet, which is almost certainly a very good thing, but there are a couple of somewhat similar cases where there were books that were trying to purport themselves to be parody or other works that were in some way transformative that have been taken to court. And then sometimes they lose because they're not transformative enough. Enough. Interestingly though, like from what I looked at, in most cases where a, a work is considered to not be fair use, where it is considered copyright infringement, basically what they 
they're ordered to do is cease publishing copyrighted work or whatever, which means they need to cease economic activities wherein they are making money off of this work that does not constitute fair use. So to me, what that makes fairly clear is that one of the major defenses that fan fiction has and that fan fiction writers have for their work, even if it's using copyrighted material, is that fan fiction is a completely non-commercial entity. But there isn't just copyright law to consider here, there is also trademark law. This does tend to um, come up less often though, because you don't just like automatically get a trademark on things. You have to apply for it and then you have to prove that whatever you applied for counts as a source identifier for your brand. AKA it can be used as a very distinctive identification for your brand, basically like, like Mickey Mouse. Like, okay, that's Disney. Like the mouse is Disney, sorry. Then on top of that, in order to prove trademark infringement, you have to prove that there was a likelihood of confusion within the usage of that trademark. Uh, to me, if someone is writing fan fiction about Mickey Mouse getting on AO3, it seems unlikely to me that most people would get confused as to whether or not that fan work is actually a Disney property. The one aspect of trademark law when it comes to fan fiction that I think is like potentially a concern is the idea of trademark dilution, wherein the trademark holder claims that a certain usage of that trademark will blur the line and make that trademark less of a distinctive identifier of the brand, even if it's obvious to people that the people using the trademark are not the brand themselves. And then they can also claim that using the trademark mark in some sort of improper manner will do damage to the brand's image. So just like one totally random example of that would be maybe if, for example, someone wrote fan fiction on AO3 um, about the famous mascot of a child-friendly, very powerful, very wealthy brand getting potentially. Before you get freaked out, as I've mentioned, hasn't gone to court yet. So this hasn't like technically happened before. And there are defenses against that argument anyway. Like if you prove, oh, that you've only used the trademark just as much as it is explicitly necessary for identification purposes. And courts also haven't usually gone people super duper hard if they have used that trademark in a very creative way. So basically, if your fan fiction is just as fun and creative as Aqua's song Barbie Girl, you're probably fine. The real main point though is that it is kind of complicated um, and very tricky. So much so, in fact, that the organization that runs AO3, uh, the Organization for Transformative Works, actually has a legal advocacy team where the express goal of that team is to protect fan works as creative and transformative works works that they believe constitute fair use. Although we haven't seen fan fiction go to court yet, that does not mean that legal actions regarding fan fiction haven't been taken. People have 100% taken their works down before, after getting pushback, maybe generalized or targeted even from the authors or publishers of whatever original work they're writing fan fiction about. Anne Rice's many fan fiction related mega meltdowns do kind of come to mind here. But that's the legality of fan fiction. Let's talk about some Something that is completely unrelated and definitely isn't going to connect back to anything we've talked about so far. Hermione! Hermione! The chip name for the characters Draco Malfoy and Hermione Granger from the far, far too popular Harry Potter series. Hermione has always been one of the more popular ships in the, again, very large Harry Potter fandom for a couple of reasons. Hermione is kind of a fan favorite. She is nerdy and very smart and dedicated. She's sort of bossy. She has frizzy curly brown hair and in the movies she is played by the, of course, utterly gorgeous Emma Watson. I would think of Hermione as sort of like prime bookish girl projection material. And then Draco Malfoy is very blonde and very pale and he is very old money. <laughs> He's like kind of a bad boy in the sense that until Voldemort sort of shows up on the scene, he is the main antagonist for the three main characters during their school years at Hogwarts. But he's not nearly as scary or as evil as Voldemort. What he is though is a uh, wizard racist. Yeah, he is the wizard version of racist against people who don't come from magical families. And just, yeah, just follow me here. Hermione Granger does not come from a magical family. 
family. I have heard people express confusion over the years as to why these two are shipped together. Given the enmity between them and given the fact that again Draco is wizard racist against Hermione and he's also like kind of a loser canonically but I think the whole situation is pretty simple in my opinion. Hermione is really really easy for people primarily women to project onto and Draco is like a rich bad boy. Uh, especially when you age them up, it's really easy to portray Draco as sort of like cultured and classy and intelligent and like, oh, you can do an enemies to lovers thing where he gets like over his wizard racism and learns to see her as a full human being and then they fall in love. This kind of thing actually happens so often in fandom that there is a whole trope around it, which I personally have usually heard called Draco in leather pants, which just kind of speaks to the fan tendency to portray Draco as sort of a like sexed up anti-hero type of character. Also, like according to the fan lore page, apparently this term actually comes from one of Cassandra Clare's Harry Potter fan fictions, which is just deeply, deeply funny to me. The more you know, <laughs> Hermione fan fiction that I personally have read in the past has always struck me as rather more similar to full-on romance novels than it does to most fan fiction. Obviously both romance novels and fan fiction can be anything in any way to anyone and lots of fan fiction has romance in it but I think that romance novels and fan fiction both do tend to have sort of their own kind of styles and almost genre conventions that aren't necessarily fully shared between the two. Certain phrases for example seem to have actually been invented like by fan fiction communities and are almost exclusively used within fan fiction. Think like the classic, oh. oh. And Dermione reads to me often more like romance novels than like fan fiction. Often it features a young, intelligent woman being swept off her feet and out of her regular life by a mysterious billionaire. Or, 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 or it, it, it involves a wily concubine finding her way up the ranks in the mysterious emperor's court. Or a school mistress being swept off her feet by a mysterious pirate captain. Do you get the vibe? There's a lot of mystery involved, at least. <laughs> and I'm not the only person that thinks that Dramione fanfiction is quite similar to romance novels, uh, because Dramione fanfiction has recently gotten quite popular on book talk. This is not a video essay about book talk. To be clear, if you want a video essay about book talk, uh, there are like 1 million of them. You can go watch any of those. But I can explain to you what book talk is. Book talk is technically just a group of people that post videos on TikTok about books that they're reading. And you can find people posting about basically any genre in any way. Like it's not just one thing. However, when people use the term book talk specifically, they usually are referring referring to what I would describe as a, a pretty sizable contingent of people on TikTok who are big fans of some form of romance novels. There are people who are fans of just straight up romance, any form of romance. There are people who are really into young adult romance. There are people who are really into romanticy, which is like fantasy romance. And then there's also a lot of people who are into dark romance, a lot of which includes some more not safe for work kind of content, which you might often here referred to as spice. In order to get around the algorithmic suppression of non-advertiser friendly terms and content. It can be difficult to track how things get popular on the internet, but as far as I can tell, Dramini came to book talk largely through one fanfiction in particular, the extremely dark fusion of Harry Potter and The Handmaid's Tale entitled Manacled. The fanfiction written by Senlin Yu was mostly written between 2018 and 2019. 19, steadily becoming quite popular over time before going extremely viral on TikTok in 2023. It seems to me that at first it was mostly getting posted by people who were avid or at least relatively frequent fanfiction readers and then who also had overlap with book talk, eventually exposing the fic to a much larger audience, many of whom had not read any fanfiction at all before. I actually saw a few TikTokers who are extremely famous posting about the fanfiction who I had never seen post about fanfiction before that I followed for completely different reasons, but I can't find the videos of the people I remember at this point. So you're gonna have to kind of take that one with a grain of salt specifically. <laughs> but I would say that then Manacold kind of opened the floodgates for Dramione and then a whole bunch of other fics became extremely popular on TikTok as well. 
TikTok virality has always been a little bit of a double-edged sword. For example, Senlin Yu got a book deal out of the whole thing. She is going to be reworking the story to remove all copyright infringing material and publishing it as a novel, a time-honored tradition that we usually call filing the serial numbers off. So that's great. And then there's everything else. Number one on the list of everything else is another TikTok trend called bookbinding. Bookbinding is a really cool hobby in which the hobbyist creates fully bound books, full on physical books. They print them, they create these beautiful covers for them. You can even like rebind already like a book that you get from somewhere else. And many people will bind fan fiction so that they can have a physical copy of it, uh, which is fine as long as you're not selling it for profit. <laughs> well, guess what's happening? Listen, listen, listen. Obviously, this has happened before TikTok and before Dramione and before Manacold. But I would say probably not quite at this scale. If you look on Etsy or other shop sites, you will see a number of shops that make money based off of stealing someone else's fanfiction, printing it, and binding it into a book, and then selling it for hundreds of dollars. And people will buy it. Some of these shops have anywhere from dozens to hundreds of reviews alone, meaning it's even more people than that that actually bought the thing. The practice is problematic for uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, these fan works that they are selling are stolen already. So that's already like baseline, huge copyright infringement. The shop owner is stealing someone else's work and making a profit off of it, which is um, just like a messed up thing to do. But uh, quite frankly, even if these shops had permission or, or if they were owned by the author themselves, uh, there's still going to be a problem here, right? Because remember when we talked about legality? One of the main protections, if not the main protection that fanfiction as an entity has is that no money is being exchanged in the production and consumption of these works. No one is making money off of someone else's copyright material. If someone is making money off of someone else's copyright material, that is a problem. And if you look on Etsy, you will very quickly see that this is almost entirely a Dramione problem. Lots of Dramione works are up there. There's a, a couple of Marauders works, um, which is another subset of Harry Potter fandom that I've covered before. Um, and then there's also so a couple of copies of My Immortal, which is everyone's favorite troll fic from a zillion years ago. Oh, and there's a couple of um, A Court of Thorns and Roses fics up there too, noting that A Court of Thorns and Roses is also a like book talk favorite and um, also that the Marauders fandom blew up a few years ago after another prominent fan fiction, you guessed it, went viral on TikTok. Uh, this is pretty clearly largely a TikTok problem and I'm not just saying that just because I hate TikTok. But when things go viral on TikTok, they go really viral. They have a tendency to reach audiences that they might not on a site with a more organic form of discovery. TikTok's algorithm will put a video in front of a lot of people who might not be familiar with the content discussed in that video. And it's very, very clear from reading a couple of comment sections that these videos are not necessarily being put in front exclusively of people who are familiar with the norms of fandom communities. These people might not be really familiar at all with the whole value of non-commercialism and the importance of it in fandom, and they also might be more used to reading physical books. For those people, seeking out a physical copy of a book is going to be very natural for them, particularly if it's a book that they really, really liked. And either they don't know, or they don't care that they're buying something that is stolen material and a legal liability. Do I actually think that bound copies of Manacold on Etsy are going to be the thing that criminalizes fanfiction? No, probably not. But things on social media have effects on the real world. And criminalization isn't the only potential negative outcome either. There are Dramione authors who have taken their work down due to being uncomfortable with other people profiting off of it. Popular Dramione authors Onyx and Elm and Gillian Eliza both announced that they would be taking their work down explicitly in response to the rampant finding and reselling of their fanfiction. And that's really bad news to a lot of people, whether you just love those stories or you really care about about fandom archiving and preservation. And wait, 
There's more. These works aren't just being bound and sold on Etsy. They're also being pirated and distributed in other ways, including as like eBooks on Amazon and other things. I, this isn't the first time this has happened to fan fiction and it certainly won't be the last, but it is rampant right now. And it's being accompanied by a few other concerning trends. Because here's the thing. I don't think that it's just TikTok virality and the popularity of Dramione that are creating these problems. I think that the virality and the overlap with with people who are unfamiliar with fandom norms are simply hastening the arrival of issues that I think are already brewing in the community. Basically making Dramione the canary in the coal mine for fandom as a whole. There's been buzz for a while about the comfort that many people feel in critiquing, often viciously, the non-commercial transformative fiction that they do in fact not even pay for. And that is a labor of love and a work that exists solely for artistic expression and the fan community. And this issue is something that is interesting to me as to what it indicates about the fandom community. I will say that this issue is something that I personally am a little bit more ambivalent about because here's the thing. When I first got into reading fanfiction, like seriously reading fanfiction, it was on fanfiction.net and it was very common to put a note in the summary or at the beginning of your fic saying that you welcomed constructive criticism of your fanfiction. And in general, I think that like somewhat more negativity or critique in reviews and comments on fanfiction was like more expected and accepted then than it is now. I'm not necessarily saying that I think that's the way that it should work. Like I do believe that when it comes to fanfiction, which is something that people are doing for free, you definitely like shouldn't give any critique at all unless the author explicitly asks for it. But overall, when it comes to the issue of critique and fanfiction, I am definitely like less vehemently opposed to the concept of it existing at all than I am like other violations of fandom etiquette. The actual negativity of it and the fact that critique is happening isn't what really concerns me about that issue in particular. What concerns me is the incessant treatment of fan content as completely indistinguishable from actual like professionally published work. Something that kind of exemplifies this for me is the sort of insistence of people on creating active Goodreads review pages for like really popular fan fiction, regardless of course of the author's personal opinions as to whether or not they want a Goodreads page to exist for the fic. And these things are far from the only examples of what I'm trying to illustrate for you, which is a significant cultural shift in fandom. People on TikTok clamor for the implementation of a recommendation algorithm on AO3, even as the algorithmically driven Wattpad gets pumped so full of ads that it is virtually unusable for reading fanfiction. People want a dislike button. People want to sell commissions of fanfiction. Everyone is so used to every second of their time being monetized that they are specifically asking for platforms themselves to monetize them. Within the age of optimization that we live in, at any given moment, you really have to culturally be earning or be improving. And the only reason you even care about improving is so that you can be earning more. It seems to me that with every passing day, everyone's desire to monetize all of our interests grows ever stronger, as does our complete inability to interact with or care about things that aren't or can't be monetized. And listen, people have to eat and people deserve to be paid for their labor. I want to get paid for crying out loud, but I don't know that I think it's worth sacrificing the last non-monetizable space that we have left to the demons of capitalism. I think there are ways that you can earn money in fandom related ways and be fine. Like you can, I think you can, you can sell t-shirts with fandom related terms on them and people will buy them. You can file off the serial numbers on your fix so that it's no longer copyright infringement and then publish and sell that. But I don't think that you should be able to steal from other people or put the entire community, the entire enterprise of writing fan fiction in legal danger in order to make money. Ultimately for fan to work, at least the way that I believe that it should work, you have to be able to see other people as people and not just as content machines. And you also have to afford yourself that same courtesy. You are worth more than just your eyeballs on ads or your data points to sell or worse, your content that you pump out at breakneck speeds. Fandom is a space that cannot be across the board and completely monetized. And for our health and safety, that's probably a good thing. Because otherwise, one day we might look up and just find that we have nothing of ourselves left.